Good evening. My name is Joe Burke. I'm the program director for the Northern Illinois University Art Museum. Our current exhibition now extended through May 14th is the NIU School of Art and Design Faculty Biennial. And in conjunction with that exhibition, we have been hosting a number of virtual faculty presentations. We will post a roster of additional talks to take place in late March very soon. This evening's presentation, Exploring Synaptic Sparks Where Performance Arts and Woodblock Print Compositions Meet, will be led by NIU Associate Professor of Art History, Helen Nagata. Professor Nagata holds her undergraduate and master's degrees in art history from the University of California, Berkeley, and her PhD in art history from Stanford University. Her areas of research include the paintings and prints of Edo period Japan, 17th through 19th century illustrated books and their function in Japanese popular culture, the convergence of arts where two-dimensional, three-dimensional literary, music and performance traditions intersect and the evolution of traditional Japanese arts in the 20th and 21st centuries. As the former curator of Asian art at the Museum of Art at the Rhode Island School of Design, Helen has served as a guest co-curator on a number of complex gallery projects for the NIU Art Museum, the Center for Burma Studies, and the Olson Gallery while teaching introductory survey courses in Asian art and upper level and graduate courses in Japanese art at NIU. Please join me in welcoming Helen Nagata in an exploration of the woodblock print and the performance arts. Go Thank you. Time. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. I feel special now. <laughs> you are special. It, it really, it, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to share some of the thoughts that have been, I was going to say percolating, but it, I, I almost said plaguing me um, in my research these uh, recent years, especially. Um, and that is because I, I have been thinking about how performance arts and visual arts, uh, and I should just say Edo period, especially Edo period painting and prints uh, come together. It fascinates me. Um, but uh, what I thought I would do today is um, just share my agony, uh, share my uh, the evolution of my thinking. And the first thing that you see here, this is a uh, text that was used when we put the call out for uh, art from artists when we were planning the show in the Olsen Gallery, The Arts Converge, Contemporary Reactions to Asian Musical Traditions. So the idea was that we wanted contemporary art, but we wanted them to form dialogues or uh, be influenced by music. And not only that, tradition, traditions of music. Um, but look at this fancy lingo here, the fancy language, the, the exhibition proposed to focus on the arts as an arena where truly the past and present can converge, sight and sound can converse, and individual experience can speak for a universal experience. Ooh, la la, sounds great, sounds grand. Um, but what I'm finding as I reflect on um, this, this topic is, you do have these aha moments. It's very exciting, especially uh, in prints when perhaps a connection was not known or um, just personally, uh, when you in your mind's eye are thinking about the performance elements, whether it's of music or verbal you know, poetry that's spoken or sounds, percussive, you know, actions that have to do with staged um, uh, moments, those it, when in your mind's eye, you're using that to um, revision, re what's the word, re-experience re a print or a painting. It, it can be very exciting. Um, but uh, I do find myself these days thinking, is it really a convergence? <laughs> is, is, is it ever really a convergence? Um, yes and no. Uh, and what I'm leaning towards in my more recent forays in, into this theme is that the, maybe the most 
interesting stuff happens when you've got a kind of parallel creativity. You know, when you have an evolving creativity, not only of the visual arts, but in how they're addressing performance arts. Um, and sometimes it's more of an orchestration. So not really a connection, intersection, but sort of a parallel things happening together. Uh, or sometimes I get the sense that the, the real um, uh, interesting aspect is when you've got improvisation going, ooh, typo, sorry, I apologize, I apologize. improvisation. Um, but in terms of these um, sparks, the, the sort of aha moments, I want to introduce a former student of mine who is now turning her attention to developing a research project for this year's conference on undergraduate research and engagement. Um, I'm not going to say cure because I don't really know. <laughs> C-U-R-E. Um, when she proposed working on an ukiyo-e actor print for my class, I encouraged her to figure out the theatrical moment referenced in the print. And she came through remarkably in this regard. I would like you to hear her speak of this in her own yeah. words. So Sandra, uh, Sandra, you'll take a, a five to 10 minutes or so. Uh -huh. and, yes. Okay, great. Uh, what should I do? Stop share? Yeah, so I've got the print pulled up on my screen so I can, I can share what I've got here. Hopefully if I have that ability. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. All right, can you all see it? Yes. Yeah. All right. So this is the actor Onoe Matsutsuke the first as the priest Shinkan by Katsukawa Shanko. It's an Edo period print within the Yakusha E genre, and it measures about 31.8, excuse me, by 14.2 centimeters, which puts it within typical parameters for Hosoban measurements. The print quite handily shows how intricate the functions of Yakusha E prints are communicated in terms of both subject matter and print quality, and how having an enhanced understanding of a print, and also how having an enhanced understanding of the print's subject can enhance the enjoyment of a print. Shun Khan is from the play Heike no Nyogo no Shima, which is an excerpt from the war tale, The Tales of Heike. It was originally adapted to Bunkan or puppet theater and adapted to Kabuki in 1720. It was a highly popular play consisting of five acts. The Kiri final scene from act two was especially popular and is often performed alone and simply referred to as Shunkan. The general pl plot of Shunkan is that Shunkan and two other anti-Taira men, Yasuyori and Naritsune, have been living in exile on an island of divers after a failed plot. Yasuyori informs Shunkan that Naritsune has fallen in love with one of the divers. Overjoyed, Shunkan marries the two and in an exalted passion performs a dance for the newlywed couple. Immediately following, a ship approaches the island. The ship carries two messengers from the mainland. The first has full pardons for Yasuyori and Naritsune. Though because Shunkan was the head of the anti-Taira conspiracy, he has not been pardoned. A second messenger disembarks the ship and informs Shunkan that, by interve intervention of a higher up, Shunkan has been granted amnesty to go as far as Bison Province. The three are exalted up until the point where they try to enter the boat, only to be told by the first messenger that the woman must be left behind, even when told she is now Naritsune's wife. When Naritsune re refuses to leave his wife, he is forced aboard the ship alone. Shunkan attempts to smuggle the woman on board, but is thwarted by the first messenger. Shunkan attempts to appeal to his mercy, but it does not work. Furthermore, the messenger takes pleasure in informing Shunkan that he has no family waiting for him, as his wife is dead and his son long missing. Enraged, Shunkan seizes the first messenger's sword and kills him, thrusting the woman aboard the ship, stating that since he has forfeited his amnesty, there should be no problem taking the woman to the mainland. After, sa after sad farewells, the boat leaves, Shun Khan holding to the mooring rope till it's ripped from his hand. This final scene is considered the high point of the play. As Shun Khan climbs to a high peak to watch the boat sail off into the distance, 
and the play concludes, and as the play concludes, the audience is allowed to truly feel Shun Khan's loneliness and grief. This final moment seems to be the moment the actor Onoe Matsutsuke I as the priest Shun Khan seems to capture. While the exact moment presented is not entirely clear, the posture of the figure as he tries to shield himself from the rain implies both resolve yet sorrow. The way the black rain overtakes the garment that Shunkan holds over his head in an effort to shield himself implies a dark sweep of sorrow that overtakes him as he's left alone to contemplate all he has lost. Without knowing this about the play Shunkan, the prince subject may be somewhat mysterious or difficult to decipher. With the proper research, however, the spirit of the play comes through and one can truly marvel at how the prince quality and composition communicates the somber air of this moment. In addition to having knowledge of the play, having knowledge of who produced the print also enhances the enjoyment of the composition. Katsukawa Shunko was a member of the Katsukawa School of Yakusha A Production, one of three schools specializing in Yakusha A Production. The Katsukawa School was founded by Katsukawa Shunsho and made a name for itself by portraying the actor behind the role depicted in such a way that they could be recognized by facial likeness alone. The physical qualities of the piece are stunning. Despite the item's age, it still has striking shades of bright red, purple, and a yellow green. The quality of the printed line is incredibly delicate as well. The lines indicating rain have such a delicate fidelity to them, one would almost mistake them for being hand painted rather than printed. The quality of the print also emphasizes the actor. The presence of Mats Matsutsuke's form within the composition, as it is stationed in the direct middle of the composition, and the way his body curves against the black stroke-like lines appears to indicate rain. It seems to emphasize his presence further against both the rain and the background. This indicates the actor and the role it, he is in is where the importance of this piece lies. Imagining this print back when it was first printed, one could see it being incredibly appealing to the theater enthusiast or to an individual with a fondness for Yaksha A as a stunning example of art. While the composition and physical qualities of the actor Onoe Matsutsuke I as the priest Shunkan can be enjoyed and appreciated by someone who has no prior knowledge of the play Shunkan or its associated tone and themes, having the knowledge of the print, of what the print is referencing and alluding to not only gives one a sense of understanding as, he, as to the choices made within the composition, but also a deeper appreciation for the subtleties, such as the delicate nature of the black strokes and the prominent presence of the actor. That, I believe, is the true presence of appreciation. Thank you. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Sandra, you uh, did good and made me proud. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And unfortunately, I have a class to get to, so I'm going to have to duck out. But thank you for all for listening, and I appreciate it. Thank you. And I was just going to say, go, go, go to your class now. <laughs> right. Bye, so everyone. Much, thank you. Don't be late. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Sandra. Bye. <laughs> This is now we can talk about her. Um, this, <laughs> this is what I love. Uh, I, I, I love to challenge students um, to to really get to the essence of what makes a work of art, a visual composition, interesting. If we didn't know the story, we maybe um, would just think, well, it's a man uh, standing in a storm. We don't really know what's going on. And then we stop looking. But when you know the story, then you start imagining things. Um, the, the psychology behind the face, the emotions, the sort of subtlety, the depth. Uh, it's, it, it's a creative thing as well, because it will only exist in you, you the viewer. You know, no, no one's spelling all this out. And I could also imagine that perhaps if you got the print, you know, you saw the print before you saw the play, uh, when you saw the play, you would have another aha moment <laughs> where the things are connecting. So I'm, I'm going to stick with this first topic of aha connections uh, because they're fun. I mean, who would have thought that this seemingly uh, genre-esque image, both by Harunobu 
one showing a woman who must be in the pleasure quarters having a lonely quiet moment while there's a party going on in the you know inside um we can imagine the noise from the shamisen and the laughter and the drinking and here she is uh, in solitude those who know will make the connection with a kabuki play. They'll make the connection that all, all these golden blossoms um, could reference the golden coins that are tossed down by the mother-in-law who takes pity on her because she sold herself to the quarters in order to help her husband. Uh, you know, it gets convoluted, but who would have thought? But once you do um, have the connection, uh, the, the whole seeing, the image uh, changes in your mind drastically. Uh, most recently, there is a curator who was saying Harunobu was a uh, highly intelligent, educated person, uh, and he would have known no drama. Null, as in the medieval theatrical art form that would use the mask and very slow movement on a minimal stage, and usually referring uh, to classical themes. And a lot of times we're back to Tale of Heike again, <laughs> um, but you know, very deeply psychological, emotional themes. And there is a genre, a type of no play that is called the spirit plays, where uh, on that stage, a character that is unknown to the um, the monk who is traveling through the countryside will eventually make his or her um, per, uh, real person um, a, recognizable and start to retell or or relive uh, the suffering that the character went through while they were alive. Um, they're, they're the spirits of that character who are returning uh, and coming to the stage. And for that temporary moment um, on that stage, they're alive again. And by the end of the play, you have that spirit disappearing. It's a very interesting um, sort of, it, get, it grabs you, I guess. It's, it, it can get you psychologically and emotionally uh, despite the very slow movements. <laughs> um, there, there's all kinds of, a, of performance arts in Japan. Um, we already saw a reference to kabuki, which became uh, popular in the 17th century and then evolved through the Edo period, 18th, 19th centuries. Um, we know no drama was the big thing preferred by the military elite, the daimyo lords, um, so 13th, 14th, 15th century, but onward, it starts to get more popular um, in the Edo period. Uh, and if we want to go back in time, you know, the tale of Heike started as an oral tradition, uh, monks chanting uh, sort of like ballads of the uh, chronicles of the tale of Heike. And uh, that might have... Um, added to the vivid imagery and the, the dramatic form of it. It would be easier for a person to remember, um, a, you know, a long epic if there were these distinct memorable episodes. But I would say poetry is a type of performance art as well. And there is uh, there are instances uh, in Tale of Genji illustrations where when you are, are aware of the poetry, uh, the deep psychology, the thoughts and feelings of the characters, the entire illustration um, comes alive, opens up, and you see it differently after that. This is one of them. I mean, we could think about musical performance, um, the lovely flute playing in the evening with the autumn moon um, sort of distantly shining through silvery clouds up there. But the big uh, moment here is when uh, there is an exchange of poems between Genji and his father. I'm sorry, son. Uh, and this is interesting too, who's who? Um, they are also divided by this uh, beam along the upper part of the doorway, um, the wall, I guess. And we're looking down into the room through the roof in the typical conventional um, way of, of uh, setting up these compositions. But 
it turns out that the son of Genji is an illegitimate. He, he was the product of a liaison between Genji and Fujitsubo, who was the favorite concubine of the emperor, Genji's father. So, you know, big no-no. Uh, and it's been a secret the whole time. Uh, but at some point, the son, now the retired emperor, Reze, understands who his father really is. And in this interesting poem um, where he's, uh, you know, he's talking about uh, now that he's retired from being an emperor, uh, he, he is still so distant from uh, his father. Once above the clouds, now my dwelling is far off, but even this abode receives unforgotten the splendor of the moon on an autumn night. He's he's talking about his longing or his yearning to see Genji uh, and um, always thinking about Genji. Uh, unforgotten uh, splendor of the moon. The whole scene uh, becomes a uh, charged with this interesting dynamic between the two characters. Uh, but I don't want to dwell too long on every single episode. <laughs> I think you would fall asleep on me. But I did just want to make this point that the performance element uh, and how it moves us um, is, is dynamic. Uh, and when we make the connections, the visual elements come to life. It also happens just when music and the verbal um, performance comes alive. Uh, there was a nice Biwa concert at the University of Chicago a few years back where a female Biwa player, Biwa is a deep pitched lute, and it's the same kind of, well, women will play a different type than men, but it's the same lute that was used when the monks were um, uh, passing down the uh, oral tradition of chanting the tale of Heike um, uh, epic. I don't know if it will show. Am I getting lucky? This flashlight can burn for oh, no. anything. <laughs> Cardboard. Sorry, I, I never Plastic. subscribed for the whatever it's called, this thing here. <laughs> um, but in this sense, I'm thinking of the the experience when the mu music and the sounds can move you. Um, so this is a sort of connection between a nonverbal art form, performance art, and then the verbal. Can you hear this all right? I think you get a taste, enough of a taste, yes? I'm seeing a message, set up professional audio and audio settings, question mark. I hope it was okay. I hope you could hear. Um, the biwa can be percussive, can accent particular words. Um, it can help dramatize a moment. It can speed things up and create tension. Uh, or slow things down in that sort of twangy 
uh, resonant sound um, can be eerie sometimes, ghostly. Uh, when she sang, it was quite beautiful, uh, melodic even. But the preface, um, the part that she was singing, the preface here, if we think about what it's communicating, it really is uh, aligned with Buddhist ideas of life, human life being about suffering. And even though the tale of Heike will chart the great rise of the Taira clan, where Taira Kiyomori is at the top of the top, you know, he's this chancellor um, at court, uh, it will end with his fall. Uh, so it's really about the rise and the drastic fall of the Taira clan. Uh, and so there is a kind of permeation of sadness and emotion, but this is also the work that will highly romanticize warriors because of their courage or their loyalty or their suffering, um, the, their humanness. Uh, but in any case, when you know what the, uh, performance art is, and you know what the tale involves in the individual episodes, then when you're looking at a, a full-blown, you know, pair of folding screens uh, with vignettes of episodes seen through the golden clouds, it's, um, again, asking the viewer to mix and match, you know, to sort of figure out, oh, this scene must be that moment when dot, 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 and uh, provide the uh, the accompanying um, thoughts and emotions. It's an interesting way to storytell. Uh, but one last example of matching, <laughs> connecting and matching. Sometimes um, in ukiyo-e prints, there's something called a mitate-e, uh, which is horribly translated as parody prints. Uh, some people say, we need a new word. We're not sure what it is. Uh, but basically, it's an intellectual witty reference to a classical theme or some, uh, uh, what shall we say, intellectual, educated topic or theme that would be known to someone who is familiar with the classics or um, educated. And yet, um, perhaps like a game, uh, not readily apparent. Um, if you know the eight views of the Shaolin Shang, then maybe you could start looking at these compositions again to figure out how they could possibly be referencing the eight views of the Shaolin Shang. The eight views of the Shaolin Shang are um, linked to a tradition of ink painting and poetry that goes back to China uh, and that, that reference um, very deep uh, themes, uh, whether they're about um, loneliness or sacrifice, uh, the, the sort of yearnings, the, the heart um, of uh, famous poets or scholars. Um, and the eight scenes refer to these different beautiful scenic spots between the two rivers, Shao and Shang. Uh, this is a later work um, it's looking a lot more pretty, I guess, but I wanted to point out to you how this one theme about geese alighting uh, on a sandbar, um, that this is a recognizable version of the, uh, oops, I'm sorry, to go this way, uh, one of these uh, views of the Shaolinshang rivers. And when you have your aha moments, it's when you notice that the frets used on this koto, it's a type of big zither, um, are the reference, the, the allusion to the geese alighting. They don't quite look like this, but you know, <laughs> maybe if we were up close, we can kind of imagine how this is done. So even though we might think that Harunobu is uh, being witty and it's uh, meant to entertain, it's funny, uh, when you mix and match um, or connect a kind of parlor scene it related you know, with associations that relate it to the pleasure quarters or at least those who have the leisure to just um, entertain themselves with music with something that's so serious and ancient, it, it, uh, it's different. <laughs> it's more moving perhaps. I should say this one here 
is alluding to the view that talks about the distant um, temple bell that can be heard. And instead of a temple bell, we have this fancy newly imported European clock <laughs> that, that is just um, tucked into the composition there. Enough of the aha moments though. Uh, the, in the Edo period, things get very complicated not only because you have the continued arts of poetry and no drama and music, but you have on top of that, the introduction and development of kabuki theater, of puppet plays, of no uh, continuing into the Edo and now becoming, what shall we say? You know, anything done for the military elite during the medieval period would be a no-no. You're not supposed to turn that into a popular art form for commoners. But there were people who could be moved by the stories and the music and um, take it up as a hobby to learn the lyrics and uh, sing the no songs at home or um, you know, in your party setting. So there is a kind of popularization and um, knowledge that grows. And also when you have wealthy merchant class people who want to become refined and cultured, they're going to start dabbling in the arts that were, you know, that used to be just for the elite. So it gets complicated in the Edo period and maybe that's why I love it. But uh, the Momoyama period, uh, is a time of intense warfare. All the uh, various lords of the di uh, provinces are duking it out, trying to figure out who can unify the country under their control. And as you get uh, towards the end of the 16th, uh, I'm sorry, end of the uh, end of the 16th into the 17th, um, as as things start to settle down, especially with uh, the three so-called unifiers uh, taking um, power into their own hands, uh, you start to see folding screens that are intended to entertain and amuse the, the military elite. They are the patrons who are asking painters to uh, create these entertaining images of picnicking or dancing or their favorite top topics like um, dog chasing or horses in a stable or uh, visiting luxurious mansions with women who are dancing in them. Uh, this is a very old example of this type of genre painting that fits in the category of amusements of the military elite, or at least um, amusements that were in the taste of the military elite or um, were the type that were commissioned. Uh, we have a sense of um, entertainment blending into performance arts. This one is referencing the classical idea of the four accomplishments in the Confucian thinking. A scholar gentleman would practice the four accomplishments of calligraphy or poetry, painting, uh, the chin instrument, it's a, a shorter um, zither than the koto, and a board game. And here we have almost all of them. We've got painting, the board game, um, no zither, but a fancy fashionable shamisen, a three string lute and uh, some uh, sort of, what is this? A koi exchange, um, something with some sexual innuendos. Is this the playhouse? Is it a kind of entertainment uh, leisure space that the, uh, military elite would have enjoyed. So there's a whole category of genre painting that depicts uh, performance arts in terms of dance and music, merrymaking, and then you have a whole set of images that are describing kabuki. Um, and we can trace it from the very earliest examples of women's kabuki. Women's kabuki um, started with a woman named O. Okuni, uh, and she liked to cross dress actually, and performed with a lover, uh, became so popular that um, 
you know, they started to uh, have performances by the beautiful women of the local brothels. This is all in Kyoto. Uh, and they were causing such a stir. The men were fighting over her. There's prostitution going on. And the government says, no more of this. You know, this is um, bad for social order, peacekeeping, uh, Confucian ideals. Um, and they say only, so no more women, no more women. Uh, that would lead to a phase when young men take to the stage. And this almost looks like a line dance of sorts in their uh, uniform costuming. Um, so from the 1650s, uh, Okuni is, is uh, popular from um, earlier on, uh, 1590s to 1629, 30. And the young men's is popular from the 1620s to the 1650s. And they cause a similar range of problems because there's homosexuality going on. There's still men fighting over um, men for the attentions of these beautiful young men. Um, and the government says no more of this. And that just leaves the old people, old mature men. So there's a whole phase of mature men kabuki that is the only branch of kabuki that's continued on until today. This is maybe not such a good detail. It, it's from a folding screen, but maybe it's not so good to show because there are a, a whole range of different types of people here. But what's fascinating about the um, kabuki performance style in the Edo period is you do start to get the craft evolving so that you have men who specialize in female roles and, and they are studying how to be beautiful women, how to be cultured, how to move just like women. There are men who are specializing in the manly, heroic, you know, muscular, strong male type. Uh, and you have this, uh, this way of um, plays that are starting to take advantage of the greater um, uh, ability of the performers to, to project different types of characters, and they start wearing fancier and fancier costumes. Uh, they start playing with the makeup. And uh, there, over time, you start getting this um, syncretic kind of symbiosis, I guess is a better word, between prints that are showing fashionable kabuki actors um, and the, the commercial end of textile designers and kimono sellers uh, trying to um, bring out products that would sell. Uh, the prints would promote kabuki. Kabuki promotes print selling. You know, so they're all uh, sort of working to promote their crafts and to bring in some money. But you get a lot of experimentation with how to show these entertainments. Uh, one more aspect of uh, these descriptions of performances is the idea that they blend in with the genre of famous place pictures. So if you want to know the famous places in Edo, normally a famous place would be a place that's important in, in poetry. So maybe a, in classical poetry, a place of scenic beauty or a place that is already referenced in famous plays. But um, it, for Edo, you get famous places that are famous for the entertainments or <laughs> famous for, um, you know, the sights to see. Uh, this one, you know, it's a huge work, a pair of eight paneled screens, but uh, not only do you have the real famous places of temples, you know, historic, um, historically important places, but you have a lot more uh, going on that are showing off the entertainments. <laughs> so I guess these are acrobats. Um, there are, I think, two different public bath uh, houses. Uh, we get, um, oh, here's a nice close up. Uh, and people, you know, the audience is just as entertaining <laughs> as the performers, I guess. Uh, we have what looks like a kind of kabuki dancing going on, and then puppets. So all of it's kind of uh, happening in Edo. This is a wonderful way to try to send out the message that Edo is a happening place. It's prospering, it's, it's flourishing. Come and see the different um, entertainments. <laughs> Maybe this would have to be under the radar of the government, but it's not 
it you know it could also be if a, a high you know ranking lord was interested in this it could be another way to show the prosperity of the city uh you know sort of proudly display the prosperity of the city but for me the aha moment came when i was working on moronobu's pictures i was puzzling over you know how to explain how different they look from older publications uh, that might have the similar uh, subject matter, um, scenes of a kabuki theater or scenes um, in the Yoshiwara or street scenes, uh, different kinds of people, but his figures have a bit of a flair to them. Um, they're a little more interestingly posed. They look, uh, dressed in a more fashionable way. And as I was thinking about this, my aha moment came when I realized he's tapping into Kabuki. The romantic young man type who often gets in trouble, ends up, you know, maybe in a double suicide story. Um, the manly stance of a ferocious uh, male character, the elegant, um, woman on the stage who would walk with knees slightly bent well so does him so does he but um i could see it in the style of figures that modonobu starts to create as a kind of trademark um, style so that was my aha moment just seeing you know how the theatricality of kabuki could uh merge into the picture making to describe the pleasure quarters or kabuki and suddenly you've got um, a much more engaging appealing uh, sort of picture um, and it, it has these nuances of the uh, the taste that a military elite um, patron would like, you know, it sort of hints back to this sort of expensive art on folding screens and whatnot. This has been such a curious painting because um, it, we actually see a, a couple um, smooching back here, um, but we're guessing at some point there was a screen hiding them. And when that screen pigment um, flaked off, we have this nice clear view, but really inventive poses, maybe a little unnatural, but still, you know, helping us uh, get a sense of the playfulness, uh, the, the leisure, the romance. Uh, and this is from a printed book by uh, with illustrations attributed to Modonobu that I worked on for my dissertation. Uh, this style uh, is a, also seen in a printed book that features kabuki actors. And I was working on that for a conference paper recently. Uh, the two are a type of set uh, pairing because they both have this interesting pointed arch uh, border uh, to separate the text above and the pictorial composition below. They both have a line of crests, family crests that suggest a reference to the famous people or um, families. Let's skip over this. <laughs> um, and this is what I mean. It's This is the other book that is supposed to be stories of actors past and present, uh, but it's set up the same way. So we can almost imagine that it came out as a set. It certainly came out in the same date, 1678. But what fascinated me was how the text starts to talk about a a performance called uh, Shiki Sanban, and another way to refer to it is Sanban Sol. And uh, then there is a lot of this uh, text here that seems like it's just purely phonetic, um, almost as though it's uh, supposed to just be a percussive sound from a drum. Um, but the more I study, the more I realize, no, it is actually the real text that's related to um, a play that features this character here, the old, kuna, old, kina, um, old man character who is recognizable because he puts on a mask. Uh, this, I think I can end after I talk about this because it's going to take a few minutes, but 
the Okina mask, the no play, it, this would have been performed at New Year's time or the beginning of a, a long program. And it was a way to um, sort of ward off evil spirits, call in um, prosperity for the land, a good harvest, you know, sort of communicate with the gods. And at some point, this figure becomes like a god. But actually, I take that back. There is a godly figure wearing a mask at the beginning of a Noel performance of Samban Song. Uh, there, there is an uh, in-between uh, sort of dance performance that symbolizes the um, uh, sowing of seeds in the fields or stamping like crows uh, into the land and warding off evil or um, it, praying, uh, you know, referencing the waters and the sky and uh, cranes and tortoises, all these auspicious symbols um, referencing longevity. Uh, and then there's a final um, appearance of an old man type. He wears a dark colored mask and it's the uh, Kyogen version. Uh, you know, so the first appearance of the old man is very serious. And the second one, brings us back to a serious nod again, but because it's connected with Kyogen, um, Kyogen used to be the, the kind of farcical comic interlude between the more serious no plays. So there's a thought that that would actually be appropriate for Kabuki. Um, a serious godly performance of the no stage would not be allowed on the Kabuki stage. It, it's just too you know um, sacred. But uh, it, it, we can imagine that this is the Kyogen, the comic version of that stately old man figure. Um, and sure enough, this is actually the libretto. But what fascinated me was that it starts so early when you're still looking at a, sort of a parlor room where there's entertainment. Uh, we can guess that these are patrons uh, relaxing with actors. Um, these must be the uh, actors who specialize in female roles because they've got a little cloth on their head. Um, and then it, it continues across the register as we see an image of the green room and we can imagine uh, the performers having their hair done, uh, putting on their makeup or setting up their drums, practicing. I love this sort of <laughs> a pair of wigs that are just on the ground there. <laughs> but this is all um, not quite what you would see if you were to visit this, the Kabuki theater to see the performance. What I learned from the classical dancers um, of Shubukai that I consulted with was, this is not a typical pose. I mean, there's all kinds of funny things about it, the feet that are sticking out, um, but even the way the fan is held uh, and what is going on with this sleeve, this is not a typical pose, but they were saying maybe you could imagine that he's about to start moving. Um, they went through a lot of the illustrations in this book and they were, it came up a lot. This is not the typical pose. Um, and Kabuki is famous for its poses <laughs> where you, you freeze and the actor has their moment. You know, it's usually climactic um, and it's when everyone starts to cheer. But they were saying, this is like, um, these are figures that are moving into position in order to strike a pose. And they were also noting um, the, the strangeness of how uh, some of the musicians would be posed, or sometimes they're looking off to the side. Uh, and then of course, even the stage. So then noticing all kinds of things that weren't standard. But I thought it would be fun to uh, bring this in just to help us understand that Mononobu, whether or not he saw a performance that was really just like what is performed today, uh, still his way of depicting the same character here, um, we have to 
wonder, is he doing this so that we can become engaged in this pose that's about to become? You know, is he finding new ways to draw us into an image? And um, when I was talking about orchestration of uh, various performance arts, I was thinking of how the music, the chanting, the dance, um, that these are all, uh, you know, they're not locked in step. It's not like a Western, you know, a three quarter beat or something. Um, there's a lot of kind of separate strands that come together um, or go off on their own. And I was thinking that the illustrations almost do the same thing. Did any of this have a link? I must have. Oh, maybe this is it. Um, I wanted to show you a little bit of this if we have time got five more five minutes left I hope it will work uh let me go to the other link it's more interesting maybe no um I think what's interesting is one more um link. Wait a minute. Sorry, I'll go back to the desk. Oh, wait, here we go. This is that in between dance and he does a lot of stamping and uh, you know, like crow's feet. And then at, towards the end, he puts on this mask to do his, the comic version of the godly old man dance. And then true to form, most dances for no drama at least will have a sort of cycle where they go from slow movement to faster and faster movement and finally to this kind of climactic moment towards the end. Actually, let me go to the very end. I hate to cut them off. <laughs> um, can you see this or no? 
I'll go, I want to go back to the desktop, I think. Did this work? Um, I didn't get to this, even though I used it for the promotion. But <laughs> what I found was um, when you know the play and you know it's about uh, a lover's suicide, double suicide, and the play tells you what the emotions are that lead up to it. And when you know also that the play has been developed based on a real event, most of the double suicides that are um, turned into plays by Chikamatsu Monzaemon were um, sort of the news of the day. They, they really happen. Uh, but what he's famous for is how he turns the dialogue of these lovers as they're, they've made the decision, they're, they're forced, um, they, they accept their situation, and uh, there is a kind of purity, this michiyuki, this final walk towards their death is uh, a moment in uh, kabuki as well as um, in the puppet plays where you feel that you are getting an insight into the best, uh, the most noble thoughts and um, loyalties and purity. Uh, and at the same time, you, you can sympathize because they're caught in difficult times. Usually it's because a person who can't afford to be in love with a woman of the pleasure quarters gets caught up um, trying to buy her, her freedom or uh, steals money or um, is, uh, is whose reputation is, is uh, damaged because of the liaison. Uh, so it raises questions about true love and um, what, what you're willing to do for that true love, uh, et cetera. Um, but the pictures themselves get very inventive in terms of how they translate uh, the walking, uh, the final path that you see in puppet theater or in kabuki into prints that form their own sort of drama uh, that you can uh, layer on to what you know of the story. And there's also a lot of sort of playfulness as well with witty illusions, but when it gets sort of serious, it, it, uh, it's not just an illustration anymore, it's something greater and beyond. I hope I at least touched on the three topics <laughs> that I tried to <laughs> outline, and I, I hope this was of interest. I'm sorry that it's like six o'clock now, um, but if there are questions, I don't know how you wanna do this, Joe. Um, people can unmute and ask questions, or they can put them in the chat, or if you have comments. I know some people had to get to their six o'clock class. Oh, I see a chat. Yeah, I see Mary's comment. Maybe no comments. Am I off the hook? Questions? Oh, I see more people joined. Maybe it's dinner time. <laughs> I should stop sharing. Did I do this correctly now? I hope so. No, that seems fine. If anyone had any comments or questions for Helen, otherwise, um, I just want to thank you and your student, Sandra. She did a great job. Thank, please thank her when you see her next. I will. I, I hope she has to apply for that um, that conference for undergraduate mm -hmm. research. I, I I hope she will <laughs> get it. <laughs> I want her to get an award. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for tuning in. I appreciate it. I appreciate you doing this, Helen. It's been delightful to view these works and benefit from your knowledge about them and the accompanying performance pieces. Um, we hope that you'll be able to join us for the upcoming programs and to view the exhibition. We're grateful for support from the Friends of the NIU Art Museum, funding from the Illinois Arts Council Agency and the NIU Arts and Culture Fee, and the College of Visual and Performing Arts season presenting sponsor, Shaw Media. 
I hope you can see the chat there, Helen, because there's several people leaving you comments. Oh, oh, that's nice. Yeah. So if you want, you I'm can. happy to see the thank yous. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Helen. Bye bye. So what shall I just leave or oh, they're, they're still commenting oh. to you. So Oh, there's Ruby. Thank you, Ruby. Thanks for attending. I don't know if you can see all those comments. Uh, I think I'm seeing everything and I'm happy to see Peter O. Does that mean Peter O. Olson? Yes. <laughs> so. Thank you very much, Helen. Be, be available.